Okay, welcome back. I think today is Monday. I'm not too sure. You know, I told you I filmed these way ahead of time so that I can make sure I don't do anything wrong and add some effects. And uh, like last lecture, we're on a very different track. And I hope this is actually a little bit more fun. It's not as, you know, it's not equations coming out of our ears. It's a lot of just facts about spectroscopy and we're going to do a little bit more of that today. And next lecture, um, a little bit more, but it'll be a little harder, a little bit more finer detail. So like last Friday, we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum. And so I hope you remember that. There's just a low energy part, right? That's the, see, you start in the radar microwave range, then you got infrared, visible x-ray, that's, that's most of it. And we talked a little bit about how you make light at those different wavelengths while the light bulb or an LED does good at the visible. Other wavelengths are actually really not, not easy at all to make light at those wavelengths. And we have applications for, for those photons, right? We, we make radar detectors for speed. Um, we make night vision goggles. Well, actually, that's not, not <laughs> you don't need to generate the light, you just see it. Um, X-rays, we do studies on materials, and it just turns out to be, in some cases, like exceptionally difficult to make light at certain wavelengths to the point that the X-rays generated in Argon, that's it, all fine and good, but that facility costs a billion dollars, and they're, they're throwing another billion dollars at it to upgrade it. Uh, so there you go. Big picture, just a lot of facts. So there's more stuff in terms of your strategy for exam three, which is really soon, and a final, which is right after that. There's more just stuff to memorize, but it isn't so mathematical. I think you're better at that. However, there is more stuff to memorize, right? There, there's some gain and loss. Anyway, that's what I was gonna do in terms of a, re of a review. It's hard to really you know, without there being equations, I don't quite know how to review that other than just to do what I just did. Uh, so today and next lecture, I'm going to get into more details on the types of spectroscopy that exist at all these wavelengths re regime. And today I'm going to start, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at low energy, that's today, and that would be rotational spectroscopy, which is, which is really, really low energy. Now, technically in the gigahertz spectrum, that is our that is just what we call it. Now I could have told you the wavelength in EV or meters, that was frequency. Um, so there you go. I don't remember what they are off the top of my head, but it's very low energy. And then I'm gonna talk about vibration as well. And again, a lot of little facts, and I, and I hope it's kind of interesting. I can tell you like a lot of things that you probably have never heard before and, and I think you'll, you'll find it kind of interesting and like a science trivia way. That's what I'm trying to do. Now, next lecture, I'm going to be on UV vis, visible electronic transitions. We've already covered that decently with hydrogen, right? Remember the lecture on difference dipole operator? And I had those movies with hydrogen. We're going to get into that, but with polyatomic. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how uh, how atomic, uh, I'm sorry, how electronic structure works for molecules and how that integrates in the spectroscopy. So again, today is rotation vibration. Uh, so I do want to remind you, uh, uh, so, so again, I'll talk about these actually next time. I just wanted to bring up th the ideas like what, what are we trying to cover, even though I'm going to talk about these next time. Uh, so for like visible, next lecture, We've already talked about how you have a selection rule. You have to account for the, uh, the angular momentum of light, which, which has an L of 1. So you better be able to account for that. You, you have to conserve momentum. Uh, the molecule has to undergo a change in dipole, but that was we know that from our difference dipole operator. So remember that lecture just not, not too long ago, right? It works in any phase. Now that means gas, liquid, solid. That's what I mean. Now, bringing that up because, again, I'm actually talking about rotational today. That has to be done in the gas phase, and I'll, I'll explain why. Okay, and you know, one of my favorite x-ray uh, core excitations, you can do x-ray analysis no matter what the phase, although it works way better if you're talking about liquids or solids. It doesn't work so well in gas. Uh, actually, neither does UV vis. It's really hard to take 
a UV vis spectra of something in the gas phase. It, it is possible. You just you just don't get a good signal. It's just like a practical thing. Um, so in terms of X-ray core excitation, I wanted to remind you what that meant. I, I think this is carbon, right? So six electrons out, that would be carbon. Um, when I say that when, when something absorbs X-rays, what happens is it would it would not be these electrons in a 2p state or, or a 2s state, it's not these getting excited, that's, that's UV vis. In x-ray, it's the 1s getting excited, and it's excited out of the atom. So if somehow I had carbon atoms, x-ray energy would blast a 1s electron. And remember, the, the thing that's kind of remarkable about that is that's not the valence. The valence is the 2s and 2p, and that's the valence because I've I've, carbon only has uh, six electrons. After I've atom, added them all, I'm done at the, at the n equals two state. So that's why that's the valence. X-rays almost always ionize. Anyway, I actually am gonna talk about this next time. I just wanted to get you kind of comfortable with, with the mode of thought because uh, these, I, I'm hoping that you're familiar with this already from analytical in class. But rotational and, and vibrational, maybe a little bit less so, especially with some of the like little fine details we're going to talk about. I really doubt you've ever heard any of this stuff before. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, and that that's great, but I, I doubt it. Okay, so so again, all right, rotation. Okay, now rotation, rotational spectroscopy, which is in the frequency range that's pretty much where uh, microwaves work and telecommunications not so much. Telecommunications tends to be done a little bit lower energy because you need to have those photons go through walls. You can't have them absorbed by water because there's plenty of water in the atmosphere. You need to have a region of the electromagnetic spectrum that, that nothing absorbs it and that's why it flies through the air because there basically is no air. It can go through buildings and it, it, you know, there's some practical things that means that it's not perfect. But again, telecommunications is done at the wavelength range that it is done at because things don't absorb it. But when you go to higher enough energy, remember, uh, again, I don't quite remember what the energy is in EV or, or wavelength in meters, but it is in the in frequency, it's in the gigahertz area. That's when gas phase molecules, and I'm pretty sure about this, I may, I may mess this up, I'll have to edit this if I, if I screw this up. I think you have to have um, you have to have a permanent dipole moment um, to interact with the very, very low frequency, uh, very low frequency light, long wavelength light that is absorbed in a rotational transition. And of course, by rotational transition, that would be like, um, you know, delta L. You remember our 3D rigid rotor? That's all rotational stuff. So these would be transitions between those energy levels. And the molecule has to have a permanent dipole moment. Um, of course, it's going to need to look something like this <laughs> to have a dipole moment. And, uh, and it needs to be done in the gas phase. I'll explain that one second. Now, the most important thing is that the spectrum is mostly dependent on this moment of inertia. And we've seen this a zillion times where you add up all the masses of, of, of I atoms, uh, I number of atoms in the molecule, you're gonna sum up their masses in some distance from wherever the, wherever the center of mass is, center of mass uh, R squared. And most of the spectrum is dictated by, by that moment of inertia. Okay, now what I'm showing here, I gotta remember the digital, I, I just was Googling what a rotational spectrum looks like, and it looks kind of crazy, right? It's just a bunch of really sharp lines. And it's, yeah, it's a, not many people work with rotational spectroscopy. Um, because for one, it is difficult to make those wavelengths. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about magnetrons and whatnot. So it's a little difficult to make that radiation. The, the equipment to do this kind of work is very specialized. Now, what do you get out of it? Well, well, you get out like a moment of inertia out of it. What's that good for? Okay, well, you can put a molecule in the gas phase and take, and take this kind of spectra, and you see how sharp the lines are. I'll talk about that in a minute. 
But what you get out of it is a really good idea of the shape of the molecule, like, like an exceptionally accurate idea of the overall shape, which can be used to try to understand the structure of the molecule. So if, you, if you're doing some supercomputer calculations like we talked about before and trying to get structure, let's say, of bio, biological molecules, maybe amino acid with water, uh, water is very important in biology, so you want to probe how biological amino acids interact with water, you could take a rotational spectrum. And you could see a little bit of, uh, it would give you an idea of how the water and, and the biological interact by the change in the moment of inertia. Now, again, that's kind of important work because it's fundamental to understand how water interacts with biological this and that. However, um, analyzing these spectra is exceptionally difficult and requires very specialized knowledge. And yeah, not many people do it. Okay, so uh, I didn't want to say too much else about that uh, other than to talk a little bit about how sharp that spectra is. Um, it turns out, now this is important, I'm, I'm going to just say this, so just put, put, put a star by this. The sharpness of spectra scales with the energy. So, uh, uh, sorry, inverse. So low energy absorptions, like rotational, the absorptions are very sharp. As you go higher and higher in energy, the absorptions become broader and broader. And in the UV vis spectrum, the absorptions are, are very, very, very broad. Okay, now why is that? Um, it turns out that there is something called a, uh, there, there's a, there's another type of uncertainty principle. Hopefully you remember the uncertainty principle between position and momentum. Hopefully you remember that there's actually an uncertainty principle between any two operators that don't commute. Remember that? We covered that. If you don't remember that, you need to be rereading your notes because this final is really freaking soon, right? If you don't remember this kind of stuff and you're trying to cram it in at the last moment with everything else, it just isn't going to happen. Right? So anyway, so we've covered the uncertainty principle. Well, it turns out there is a, a time energy, energy one, and you have some questions on your homework about this, so that'll make it stick, right? That's why we have homework. And what that is, is delta T, delta E is h bar over 2. Okay, now the way to interpret this is this would be like the, um, the, the uh, sharpness of the, of the spectrum. And this would be a time scale. That there's actually, unfortunately, there's several, time, there's several different time scales that I could be talking about. Uh, and so, you know, that's like kind of confusing. So what does that mean? Okay, well, touch on. make that spectrum go away if I haven't already. Okay, so what kind of time scales do we have when we're talking about spectroscopy? And, and, I'll, and it doesn't matter whether it's rotation, vibration, or UV vis. It's all the same. Same concepts, not the same time scales. Okay. There's really, uh, God, let me think. <laughs> I have to think about this. Um, I guess there's just two. Two that you need to know about. One is how long, oh, that doesn't look good. How long is the excited state? So how long does the excited state live? So if we're going to absorb a photon, we're going from a ground state to an excited state. Okay, so ground, excited. Little star, it's a star. Okay. Here's the deal. If you go to the excited state, you might you're, you're going to come back down. How quickly do you come back down? If it's really really fast, then here's the idea. If you relax very quickly, the idea is that you're not really sure where the excited state really is. So you see how I'm trying to I'm trying to make that like look nebulous. Not it's not clear exactly what the excited state energy is. So if the lifetime of the excited state is very short, then that would be here. That means that the uncertainty in the energy, and that would be this, becomes very large. 
Now, here's the idea. Now, for one, the equation says that. All right, cool. Uh, here's the real idea that's like, like more sensible. If the excited state isn't around for very long, how certain can you be that your measurement of its energy is accurate? Right? Now, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It's one of the few times I can actually explain something in quantum that, that actually makes sense, right? Okay, so that's called lifetime broadening. Now, there's another one, uh, and this is, this, was, this is really important. How long to absorb light? Okay, now this ends up being the one that's important. So I've shown, I've shown two different types of, two, two different ways to think of this, this time uncertainty principle where delta T, right, has two different possible like manifestations. One is how long does the lifetime live, and the other one is how long does it take to absorb light. The second one is the important one. This is usually very quick. Now recall that you've seen some movies. I've shown you a movie of hydrogen absorbing light. It took about one and a half femtoseconds. That's very short, very short. Therefore delta E is very big. So there you go. I also showed you uh, a, a case of vibrational absorption, and that took significantly longer. I think that was a picosecond. I, I don't quite remember. Now, so you can see that there is a natural time scale that it takes to absorb light. And if the delta E is bigger and bigger, then your spectra become broader and broader. So um, now, now, I know that, that that's maybe a little bit hard to swallow, but let, let me just summarize and help myself. You've seen these movies where I've shown you that absorption of light is not instantaneous. I also showed you that the lower energy one, the vibration, was done over, over kind of a longer time scale. Uh, oh, wait, how long was that? That was like 100, 150 femtoseconds. That's right. Uh, some, odd, some odd number of 100 femtoseconds. And, and vibrational spectra are, are sharp compared to electronic absorption like hydrogen, which took about one and a half femtoseconds. Vibrational spectra with a very long transition has a, sh has a sharp absorption. UV vis, electronic transitions, which are quickly, are very broad. Okay, so, so there you go. Now, let me, I have a folksy way of explaining that. Let's think about the wavelength of light. Right? So here we go. Here's a wave of light. Now I ask you to measure the wavelength. And you could probably give a pretty decent measurement. You would measure here, but for good measure, you could measure here. Now I'm being a little fanciful, but this gets the idea across. So uh, I've got enough of a wave here. I've got, I've got some ability to measure this, and I think I would have fair accuracy. Okay, now, in terms of this lifetime, yeah, this, sorry, the, the, not the lifetime, the um, how long does it take to absorb light, let's say that this transition is so quickly that you only get to observe this. You only get to observe this much of the wave. So, the question is, what is the frequency, right? If I show you this and say, give me the wavelength, you're going to look at that and be like, I, I don't know that I can. Well, you can. You can maybe try to estimate it, but yeah, you don't really have enough information. That's what's going on here. The absorption of light is so quick that you're not even sure what's the right frequency for exactly the reasons I just showed, and I hope that makes sense. If you don't know the frequency, then you don't know the energy either. And if you don't know the energy, then your absorptions become broad. So there you go. That is why molecules absorb light. And when you see the spectrum, the, the, spectra, the, the transitions could be narrow, low energy, long time to absorb light, or they could be very broad. The absorption of light is very quick. That's generally true for high energy electronic transitions. The spectra are very broad. Okay. All right, now, this has been a long blah, 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 but I don't even know why. Uh, let me explain how that is relevant to, um, to rotation. Rotation uh, is, takes a long time it, uh, to run. It takes, um, okay, so rotation takes picoseconds. Uh, 
so if I could make a movie of that, I actually, I, I was thinking about doing that, and I actually, I don't know how, by the way. Uh, it's on the order of a picosecond, and that's 10 to the minus 12. Oh, sorry, 10 to the minus 12. Okay, so that's a picosecond. All right, now why can you only do this in the gas phase? Because in solution, um, in solution, what happens is that this thing, well, let's draw it a diatomic and it has a dipole, it needs to be rotating, right? It needs to rotate. But what happens is that there's, let's say that's water, right? What happens is there, it's surrounded by solvent, and what happens is it runs into something and goes back. In other words, it's not free to rotate. It can start to rotate, maybe because it's absorbing light, but it can't really get too far before it hits something. It hits something, and then it's just jostled. It's no longer rotating or not rotating the same way. Now, what that happens is in, in gas phase, and, uh, and I just showed you a spectra there a minute ago, which is unbelievably sharp, in solution, or yeah, solution, what happens is you get broadening that's so bad that you just can't even see it. Right? So here, here's our here the x-axis is is the uh, frequency, but because this thing doesn't have enough lifetime before it, it gets disturbed, there's broadening that's so broad that you, you actually just can't even see the transitions anymore. So that is why rotation has to be done, has to be done in the gas phase, gas phase only. Okay, now that brings me to vibration. So vibrational spectroscopy. Now we started out assuming that the potential energy as a function of bar was was basically a spring, right? And remember that R is the display. So, so we like to think of R as being the display as um, the the distance between a, you know a bond. That's the bond length, the diatomic. Uh, we're going to think about diatomic first, and that is parabolic. Right, that is the definition of a parabola. That's the best I can do. And we've already covered that there are energy levels. They're evenly spaced. And so we've, we've covered a lot about this already. Uh, so I'm just kind of reminding you, uh, there's, there's a selection rule. And you're going to do this on your homework where um, you can only transition from like ground state to first excited state. Now, the way you know that is from, of course, doing the difference dipole uh, difference dipole operator, but you know the dipole operator is really there. We go. So that's that's where this comes from. Uh, the selection rule, and again, you're going to be doing this on your homework. Initial state, final state operator. If it is not zero, then that's an allowed transition. And what you find is that you can only go from the ground state to the excited state, or if you were in the excited state, you can go up one or down one, but not two. Anyway, it's pretty obvious, right? Okay. Now, now again, we've actually we've covered that. So what's there to really talk about? I mentioned that this is actually pretty bad approximation for reality. Reality is more like this. Right, now that is a real looking potential. That's what you learn in PCHEM lab. And uh, let, me, let me redraw that. Let me redraw that because I want to give you a better look at it. Um, it's really, it's, it's way sharper at first and then kind of tapers off. So at the bottom, it's rather parabolic, but then if you go higher in potential, it's not. Uh, and so, anyway, it's called the Morse, the Morse potential. And of course, we can do the quantum mechanics on this and solve the wave functions. It is 
something that I do for grad students, so we don't need to do that here. Uh, what you have is the same thing for the harmonic oscillator, the uh, parabolic potential, uh, but you end up with another term, a quadratic term. There you go. Now, notice that this extra term, uh, this is just some constant. And again, you actually, you, you're, you do stuff, you probably already gone through your rotations in Deacon Lab. So you've worked with this extensively. Um, C is just a constant related to the properties of the molecule. And what you see is because this thing is negative, um, as, the, as, as I go up in quantum number, as I go up in quantum number, this negative part shapes off more and more energy. So what that means is that the levels are going to get closer together. And I hope I'm doing a good enough job with that. They start getting arbitrarily closer and closer and closer together. And in fact, they get infinitely close as I get to, you know, you can see that this comes to an end at some point. So I'm going to quit here. Okay, so the spacings get closer and closer uh, together because of that term, which is just the solution to the quantum mechanics of this more complicated potential, which again is um, something that I, it's more of a grad school thing, but I, I think you get the idea, right? You're going to, um, you're going to have a Hamiltonian and you're going to solve it and you get wave functions and the wave functions give you energies and that's what you get. Okay. Last bit before we get to some more interesting things about vibration is uh, in peak and lab. I know that you've already seen this, so I'm just going to remind you of this fact that when you are looking at here, I'm going to like blow this up substantially. So I'm going to look at the ground vibrational state, and let's do the next excited state. Okay, you have to conserve energy. And remember that in Pekin lab, you're in the gas phase. So guess what? You have those rotational spec rotational lines on top of that. Now the thing is that difference dipole deal works for vibration and rotation simultaneously. So what that means is, is that you can't ignore the fact that there are vibrational levels on top of the rotational levels. So the solid line, I'm just showing what the quantum mechanics of the Morse potential give you. And the dashed lines are the, like 3D rigid rotor, the rotational quantum mechanics. Now the way that this manifests itself is that if you're going to have a transition, you've got to conserve energy. And you, you have to transition between vibrational states, but you also have selection rules for the rotational states and you have to conserve energy. Now, when you add all those effects together, instead of a spectrum, so here's the intensity, instead of a spectrum that is just a single peak between here and here, of course what you get are a variety of peaks, which, are, which correspond to the transitions between the rotational states. And that's why you get this type of um, this type of structure. So there you go. It's, it's usually even. So I'm trying to do it that way. So there's the intensity. I didn't do such a good job with that, but, but there you go. Now the next bit I want to tell you about this is that you actually will see a similar manifestation with electronic spectra. Electronic spectra have rotational spectra on top of it. And it's a little harder to see because the lines are broader, the absorptions are broader in UV vis. They're so broad that they tend to wipe out the vibrational part. But, but what I've drawn here, you could just say that these are electronic transitions and the dashed lines are vibrational transitions. And so you can see in some molecules, you can see like the FTIR spectrum imprinted over the UV vis spectrum. Not many molecules show that, but, but it is a thing. So uh, with that, uh, I want to now talk about a little bit about how molecules 
vibrational spectra is different than everything you've ever learned, PCAM lab or whatnot, was done with, um, a, you know, just like HCL, right? So what's important about that is when every time I, I or probably anyone has ever talked about vibrational this and that, especially with, um, especially with diatomics, there's only this one value of R, there's only one bond, right? But a polyatomic has multiple bonds. So that's gonna lead to some differences. Let me wipe out the board, and that's what we're gonna explore for most of the rest of the class. Okay, polyatomic vibrations, how do those work? Okay, let me remind you that that you learned this rule, and you probably heard this a long, long time ago, probably gets brought up every other class, right? That a molecule's number of vibrations is 3n minus 5 for linear, and 3n minus 6 for uh, nonlinear. And uh, remember that most molecules are nonlinear. So, um, the question is now, I'm going to work with a simple molecule, I'm going to work with water, and I'm going to try to identify those vibrations. Let's see, okay, so for H2O, I, the number of atoms is three, it's not linear, HCl is linear, so this is not linear, so the number of vibrations, of course, three times three, uh, 3 times 3, <laughs> that's 9, minus 6 is 3. 9 minus 6 is 3. Now, in case you maybe you forgot this, but where you get the minus 5 versus minus 6 is the, uh, that's the number of rotations. And, uh, you know, a molecule can rotate like this, like this, and it can rotate like that. So, anyway, you know about rotations. Okay, so anyway, that's just where we get those. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do water. And what I want to do is I want to try to identify what the vibrations are. And I see two bonds. And so I'm going to go ahead and say that, well, that one, that one is, a, is a vibration. And so, and that then leads to my second one, which of course would be just the same on the other side. Okay, so that was easy. Okay, now I've got to do a third. And again, I'm just going to logically walk my way through this. And now that I've stretched both of those, and I would say that, of course, compress, you know, going the other way would be the same thing, right? Uh, I guess what I could do is um, I could do technically both of these. Uh, so, so I can do like that. There we go. That's another vibration. You know, technically, I guess I could. I could do this, couldn't I? Could um, technically a, is that like a bend? I could do that. I mean, it is a type of motion. And if I do that there, then I could also do the other one. And then I could then do, I mean, just like I did with number three, I could do them both simultaneously, right? So, uh-oh, oh, hold on. I've got three, I've got three different vibrations, but I've easily logically walked my way to having six. So, huh. You know, I'm already starting to think like, well, maybe, you know, this plus this equals that, so maybe you can't do that. So I could maybe eliminate that one because these two are, are equal to that. You know, we're always adding wave functions, right? Uh, and then that means that this one isn't real because I can take four and five and get six. So it's really down to one, two, uh, one, two, four, and five, but that's three. The four, so it has four, and I'm supposed to have three. Uh-oh. Seems like I have a problem here. Even on a simple molecule like water, I'm not able to identify the correct vibrations. If I can't identify the vibrations, then I don't have anything. 
Okay, now here's the solution. Okay, now you know that wave functions, you have to solve a problem. Wave functions have to be orthogonal. Now you may recall that is when uh, two wave functions that are not the same have to be, have to, have to, if you multiply them and integrate, you get zero. Whereas if, of course, if it's the same wave function, uh, that's one, because that's the normalization condition. So this is called orthonormalization. Uh, normal, normalization means one. The ortho part of orthonormalization is this. You had this on a homework problem. Okay, we've got to have this property exist for these vibrations. You have to have the same thing. So let me point out, let me, let me go back to a diatomic and just point out this that if you want to think about this as a vibration and you want to think about this as a vibration, so this is one and this is two, uh, those are not orthonormal because two is equal to minus one. All right, so that's, that, those are not orthonormal. So, so that's the idea. We've got to have these moving in certain ways such that this is true. Now I can tell you that the the method, the mathematical method you use to do this is very complex and only advanced grad students learn how to do it. Let me just tell you a little bit about what it is. And, and that'll be enough. Okay, what it is is called a force, what is it called? <laughs> so it's called a force geometry method. Uh, use matrices. It's, it's a little even above my head. I never actually learned how to do it. I know about it. Uh, but it works like this. What you need to do is plot in three dimensions. We got x, y, and z. What you need to do is, okay, uh, what you do is you take the molecule and you figure out the force constants. And what you can do is you can take every atom and push and pull on it in every direction and see how much energy that takes. That's, that's the definition of spring constant. So the trick is, for this force part, you take every atom and you move it in every direction and you see how much energy you get as a result. And that's what allows you to figure out a force constant, a spring constant, for every atom in every direction. So and you do this on a computer. Now there's the geometry. There's the geometry part. So let's think about the symmetry elements of water. It turns out that, okay, I'm drawing these planes these planes are bisecting the water molecule in ways that are unique. So, here is the oxygen. Okay, so you can hopefully see what I'm doing here. Is I've identified several symmetry elements. For one, the H2O lives in a plane, right? This plane right here. But there's another plane that bisects it right in the middle. And then the left and right uh, sides are basically mirror images. So this is like a mirror plane right here. And it lives completely in this plane. And that means that it has a symmetry designation, which is called, now, now you don't need to remember this, but it, uh, we, we have ways of figuring out what kind of symmetry elements are in the molecule and then we can even give it a label. And this one is called uh, C2V. C2V type symmetry. Okay. Now, the point of this is that using this information with all the force constants, gives, you put this into this algorithm, and the output of the algorithm are the actual vibrations. And those vibrations, because they're special, after having done all these calculations, they have a special name. They're called normal like orthonormal, normal modes. 
Now again, I, I can plug this into a computer, and that's how I do it. So that's why I'm not going to beat you to death on this. And you and the computer will then it's like animate the normal modes. And what you would see, they get these designations. Here's what they really are. Here's one of them. Of course, there's only three. It's the hydrogens vibrating, kind of like I drew before, but the oxygen moves a little bit too. So it's kind of like it's like that. Okay. Again, you could not look at this and figure this out. You have to have a computer. Now, here's another one that looks similar to what I had drawn before. It's um, it's like that. And the last one is, is very asymmetric. And it looks like this. It's, uh, it's kind of like shimmying. That hydrogen is going one way. This hydrogen, so this is why this is like an asymmetric. One's stretching while the other's compressing, and then the oxygen ends up moving a little bit in the process. Okay. Now, so that's how you identify what these things are. And um, the last bit is and, and, um, to show you in terms of like, okay, now what do I do with quantum mechanics with that? Well, what you would do is fit these into the same, and unfortunately we usually go back to our parabolic representation of, of these modes. So these modes are like considered, just like the bond, compressing or expanding is one motion. Each one of these is, is one motion. It's just a complex set of vectors. But we, we describe that, these, all these lines I've drawn are vectors, we describe that set as one motion. So what I do is, I simply say that my x-axis is, corresponds to that complex motion. And if I move the atoms along these paths, and, and I calculate the energy on a computer, I would get something that's kind of parabolic, maybe it's more like a Morse potential. And then I can calculate the energy levels, and then I know how much energy is, it takes to go in between them, and then I can compare that to a uh, FTI or a spectrum. And if this is in water, then I know that there will be rotational lines on top of that. So I can slowly, just knowing the molecule, its symmetry, force constants, and yes, this, it's complex to the point it has to be done on a computer, but I can start to reproduce the, the infrared spectrum. So, so that's how that part works. All right, last bit is uh, Raman spectroscopy, and we're pretty much done. Um, let me wipe out the board on this one. Okay, Raman scattering, just a few more moments. Uh, the way this works is, let's think about uh, atoms, those are the nuclei, and we've talked a bit about how the way to think about bonds is that there are electrons that are shared, you know, the, each atom comes with its own electrons, and if you want to form a bond, if that's just going to happen, we'll say that's like HCl, the electrons end up just crowding around, around the nuclei and in between, and that's really what a bond is. You've got negative charge, a positive charge from a nucleus, negative charge in between and another nucleus, and that's electrostatic loop. Positive, negative, positive. Those are held together electrostatically. That's really all a bond is. Okay, what happens is with Raman scattering is that if you add light, what can occur is that there is a distortion in this electric field. Maybe it's towards one direction. A little bit like that. Anyway, I'm just trying to, to draw that you have this nice symmetry to the electronic distribution, the way the electrons are flying around the nuclei, but under certain, with the right kind of molecule, that electronic cloud gets distorted, and that is called um, polarization. That's when you just basically, it's kind of like imagine magnetic filings, uh, iron filings. And, and you move it around with a magnet, that's kind of like what polarization is. Light is an electric field and it shifts the electrons around. Now if it does a good job with that, what can happen is, if that's, that's kind of like your selection rule, what happens is that 
Here is a vibrational, and again, I've done a harmonic approximation, and something is in the ground vibrational state, which it most likely is. Along comes a photon, and in a Raman transition, and this is why it's called Raman scattering, some of that energy gets absorbed to allow the molecule to vibrate with more energy, so it's undergone a vibrational transition, but you still have the photon. It's just longer wavelength, so it has less, less energy and therefore has a longer wavelength. So again, because of this polarization process, what happens is light, and this would probably be visible light, which doesn't correspond to vibrational spectroscopy. Vibrational spectroscopy is done in the infrared. But what can happen is, due to this polarization process, with the Raman process, the photon comes in, allows vibrations to be excited, and a photon comes out, but it just has less energy. And that energy, the, it has less energy by the vibrational energy. Now, the way we have to do this practically is, what I've described is, sounds complicated, right? And it is, and it's not very efficient because what I just said, it's complicated. So you're going to have to use a laser. So we have molecules in solution. It works in any phase. Um, you have to do this in solution. And I'm going to use a laser. I'm going to use a laser because I need a lot of light to go through this because this, this process doesn't, it's not very efficient. Okay, so what happens is you look at the intensity and you plot that. Let's say that we use a 532 nanometer. Um, that is, uh, 532 nanometers is a type of laser that's very common in research laboratories. We call it neodymium, yttrium, aluminum, garnet laser. <laughs> uh, it's a very common laser. Now, if you look at the intensity of the laser coming through the solution, of course, the laser intensity is really, really gigantic. In fact, you would have to build a, a kind of filter to make sure that the laser doesn't go straight into the detector. That would just blow it up. So, of course, you see the laser, but then if you go further out, you'll see a peak. And that peak will correspond to this transition. Um, so, what's neat about this is, and this will be at, um, at a different wavelength, not very far away. I, I'm not, I just made this up, by the way, but um, that's the idea. You'll see a scattered peak. You'll see some intensity of laser light that was that has less energy due to this Raman process. Now the reason we do this is that it's a way to do vibrational spectroscopy but using visible light. Now that's actually super useful. Remember how I just said that making infrared, making light at different wavelengths is really difficult? We're pretty good at visible. Lasers are awesome. And lasers are pretty cheap, right? You have some, you have laser pointers in your pocket now. So doing vibrational spectroscopy via Raman is actually kind of easy to do, and that's why it's kind of a big thing. It's also heavily used in medical diagnostics. A lot of people right now are like, like vibration of what? Well, sometimes they'll put a whole cell in a cuvette and pass a laser through it, and they get the Raman spectrum and try to correspond the Raman spectrum of like a cancer cell versus a normal cell. And you can imagine that the spectrum would be a bloody mess. There's all kinds of things inside of the cell, but the idea is that still there's a pattern unique to the cancer cell that's different than the normal cell. And that is very simple, you know, just shine a laser through it and look at the emission, look at the scatter, can tell you that. I mean, if that works, that's awesome, right? Because it's easy. So that's one of the uses of Raman transitions. Okay, I think I've gone over, but again, I hope this was kind of easy, informative, and a little bit on the more fun side, at least compared to what we've been doing. Next lecture is going to be devoted to UV Viz. It's a little harder. It's going to be a little intense. More of the same, but a little bit more, a little bit more muchness to this. So, okay, I will see you all then.